All right. Well, um, welcome everybody. I'm trying to just give people a few minutes to get in. And uh, I'm excited to Edwina. <laughs> we can talk about the <laughs> excitement afterwards. Let's see here. I um I am going to use Minty for um, some things. I wanted to wait until everyone got in before I pasted the link and the number. For those of you who are already familiar, um, let's see here. Boom. So that's the link. And this is a number. And of course, I will have to repost it as more people come because I have a couple of... Um, things that I wanted to share that um, just so I know how people are doing, because this will be an interactive conversation to the extent that we can interact um, using a webinar format. And so I will go to my previous slide. All right, here we go. So um, what I'd like to know as people are getting in is, oh, but not the number. Sorry, y'all. Here's the number, um, and I'll repaste it because I see more people coming in. To do, to do. Maybe I'll put them in one message to make it easier. Oh, it's not going to work. Space. and number all right and so we're going to try to make sure that i can um meet some of your expectations too and so we'll start here just kind of want to know how people are feeling because you know everybody's already started their day right and then um the next thing i'm going to ask i'll give you a few minutes because i see um things are still coming in i'm want to see how they settle. I can agree with the, the anxious feeling. It's kind of funny. I do a lot of public speaking. And for whatever reason, when I'm talking to my tribe or talking about something that is really near and dear to my heart, I get a different level of anxiety. It's like, I really want to get it right. Um, so this is for y'all. And oh, the closed captioning is available through um, Google Sheet being offered by Google Slides, and it may or may not be 100% accurate, but hopefully it will still be helpful. Because, um, of course, the goal is always to be helpful and do no harm. Let's see here. I'm going to switch so you can see what I see. I think that can be helpful too. So, this is the Minty um, output. And it looks like um, hopeful, anxious, excited. Um, I like that hopeful is included in that because without hope, um, how do we look forward and think forward in a positive way? So my other question is really more of a housekeeping question. And you can continue to tell me how you're feeling. But what I would like to know, too, is um, what do you hope to gain from this conversation? And this will help me kind of guide um, thoughts and, you know, make sure that I cover anything that, um, you know, anything that you were expecting to hear about. Because um, for those of you who are into Afrofuturism, it can be, you know, there, it's a pretty broad field. And in the time we have together, I'm really going to skin skim the surface and hopefully give us some some ways to think about where we are and where we want to go in a different way. So I like mind broaden reading recommendation. So one of the things I'll do after this is over is forward a reading list um, for everyone to be able to use. I know I'm already um, in a reading list deficit, but you know I probably read more than I write these days. Um, Okay, more of an ally. Oh, I love not feeling black enough. I think hopefully we'll touch on that one because wow, I've I've been um called I was called blackish before there was a TV show. 
which, you know, it's not fun. And let's see here, perspective. All right, so good. No one is asking me for anything overly prescriptive because I will tell you, um, being super prescriptive is not really my get down. I'm gonna share my presentation now so we can kind of go into the conversation. But I think you all kind of have the idea that even though I can't hear your voices, I wanna hear your voices, if that makes any sense to you. Um, I can't see your faces, but I can imagine you out there. Um, so we went through that. Um, I do have a couple of polls to launch. It'll be pretty quick. Um, one of these is, are you new to Afrofuturism? And um, this is just so I know, like, you know, if I'm talking to experts or to people who are kind of dabblers or are really um, just getting introduced to the subject. And so if you don't mind answering the poll, that would um, help me. Um, I think the poll is in front of you right now. If you can't see the poll, let me know in the chat because um, do 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 do. Oh, I'm sharing poll results. Okay, that could be. I think I launched the poll and then let's see here. Relaunch poll. Here we go. All right, now poll in progress. Thank you. Please. Oh, here we go. Thank you. I was like, oh no, why don't I see anything? Um, almost everybody has answered. All right. So just a couple more people and I'll give you a few more seconds. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go with 91% and launch and end the poll so you can see the results. Um, 22 of you voted and most of you said yes. One person said somewhat, but I do know that we have a ringer in the audience who is probably as um, geeked on Afrofuturism as I am. Um, my other question is, um, are you familiar with the works of Octavia Butler? All right, lots of, okay. So for the people that want a reading list, if you're not familiar with the works of Octavia Butler, it's a great way to start because she is known as the mother of Afrofuturism. Well, let's see here. Give a few more seconds for anybody who wants to respond to the Octavia Butler poll. And 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Here are the results of that poll. Most people said not really. A few people said yes. And I got a couple of somewhats. So that's kind of where we are. And I really wanted to do this in a transparent and visible way, as opposed to asking ahead of time, because I want us to all at every step of this to understand that we're in this together. Um, it's This is a collective. This is a equity talk. And I think one great way to approach this is from an equity lens. And so we're going to talk about what Afrofuturism is. We're going to touch on current state problems, not a whole lot. And I'm not going to go into historical perspective in terms of how we got to where we are, um, simply because I would really like to get into more of, OK, what do we do next? And then, so you see right after that, I go into what is our vision for the future? I'm gonna ask you what's good. So maybe as we're thinking, think about what you like. Um, I tend to look at things through an appreciative lens because when you start from a place of gratitude, when you're asking people to change, even if there's like 99 problems, um, there's gotta be at least one thing they're doing right. Um, Cause that's gotta be a space to start from otherwise, it makes for a very difficult conversation. And then what can be better? And then the, the big part is how do we make it happen? And um, I'm gonna give you a hint. Um, there are things we can do individually and collectively in small groups as well as big groups. And a lot of times big improvements can be made through incremental changes. Um, so going back to this screen, um, I shared, and it's, I apologize for the blurriness of the text, but I wanted to make it bigger. Um, Octavia Butler is considered the mother of Afrofuturism and her response to Charlie Rose many, many years ago about why she got into science fiction 
kind of speaks to my interest in it. I have a tendency, um, you know, to tell you a little bit about I me. Mean, one of my favorite words in the dictionary, and you might think it's a little weird to have a favorite word in the dictionary, is nebulous. And I like it because uh, it could become anything. And I like the idea of endless possibilities. My journey personally has been one of um, feeding my curiosity. When I find myself interested in something, I go learn more about it to gain an understanding. And um, Queen Mother Octavia Butler speaks to the fact that um, there are no walls in science fiction, that, that anything is possible. And there's no human condition that's off limits. You can talk about almost anything um, with a metaphor in a way that everybody involved can be comfortable enough to actually look at what the real issues are. Um, so what is Afrofuturism? And my response to you is it really depends on who you ask. Um, there are a lot of people, there are probably as many definitions of Afrofuturism as there are people studying and enjoying it. Mark Derry, Watasha Womack, Ronaldo Anderson, Adrian Marie Brown, the Dogon people, the Akan people are just some of the definitions that I tend to look to. Um, but let's start here. Afrofuturism describes visions of the future, including science, technology, and its cultures in the laboratory, in social theory, and in aesthetics through the experience and perspective of African diasporic communities. This is from Alondra Nelson, the president of Social Science Research Council, and Harold, well, yeah. But I bring up this particular definition because I think it is the, one of the broadest, most inclusive definitions that I've come across. And um, I'll give you a hint. I like the fact, I like not having any limits. Um, so on the left pictured, you will see Alondra Nelson. Immediately to her right, you will see um, the cover of Afrofuturism 2.0 by Ronaldo. Oh my goodness. And you will, by Ronaldo Anderson, sorry. And to the right, of, and that's more academic approach to looking at Afrofuturism. And then Afrofuturism is the book with the blue cover by Watasha Womack. Um, she's considered, this was considered like the seminal um, book on Afrofuturism before Afrofuturism 2.0 came out. Um, it's more anecdotal and it goes into um, kind of what it is and it talks to you about the culture of people who are um, engaged in and interested in Afrofuturism. Um, so I did say that I would be listening to you. So please, if there's anything that I say that's not clear, or you have questions, um, use the chat because I come from a call and response tradition. And since I can't see your, I can't make eye contact with you or see your smiling faces, um, this is one way that I know that I am um, either going too fast, too slow, or if I'm getting the right pace or making points clearly. Um, next to Watasha and Womack's cover, is um, Flame Wars um, Cyberculture doc book that came out in 1994 that was edited by Mark Derry, where he introduced his definition, he introduced the term Afrofuturism and his defini definition of it. And he called it, he said, speculative fiction that treats African American themes and addresses African American concerns in the context of 20th century techno culture. And, you know, it at the time, I'm sure it was quite timely. It was very relevant to the book that he was writing, but it's not my favorite definition because it's very prescriptive and very limited. And it is very focused on technology. And part of my challenge, even in the present day, is that when there's a problem, people automatically want to think you need a new computer. You either need new hardware or new software, and that's the way that you solve problems. And we're forgetting the human element and the fact that we were creating and building and connecting and making things happen way before any of this technology existed. Send a text. Um, the Akan people are, um, you can see I've drawn a little arrow and drawn a circle around where they are on the continent of Africa. And I bring them up because when you talk about culture and you talk about um, concepts, sometimes it's good to also talk about place to build and create additional context. 
And so one of my favorite, um, I don't know if it's a definition or just a different way of looking at Afrofuturism is Sankofa. And I wanted to show you who the people were because this doesn't really tell you a lot about who they are. And it's um, there, the definition from the Carter G. Woodson Center is, it is not taboo to go back and fetch what is at risk of being left behind. Um, there are some people who talk about Sankofa in terms of um, it's not too late to go back and fix it. Um, there are some people who look at it as time travel. And I say to you that um, I'm kind of fond of the time travel approach in the sense that um, you connect the things that we've learned from the past, the things we're experiencing and learning in the present to identify what we would like to see in the future so that we can proactively engage in actions, behaviors, and um, challenging ourselves to um, make change today to create a better future. Um, and if you look at the bird in the picture, um, you see that its body is planted in the present facing forward. Its head and neck are rotated back to represent or signify the past. And in its beak is an egg, which symbolizes the future. And quite often um, I weave Sankofa into some of my other work, but I encourage people when thinking about how to be holistic and connected when trying to create change or even work with people for a better tomorrow, to um, think about how everything's connected. Um, one of my favorite TV shows, which I don't know if it'll ever get another season, was um, the Holistic Detective Agency, um, because it was all about how everything is connected. And sometimes you don't see those connections. But the thing that I wanted to bring up too is, um, I wanna go back to Mark Derry, because while I don't particularly like his definition of Afrofuturism, I do like the questions he posed. And one of the questions he posed is why do so few African-Americans write science fiction, a genre whose close encounter with the other, the stranger in a strange land, would seem uniquely suited to the concerns of African-American novelists. So I wanna include the fact that um, he talked about um, the slave trade as um, being similar to the alien abduction um, stories in many science fiction novels. And if we look at it that way, we it turns um, perspective and also changes a look at, um, you know, how do we go forward from there? Um, so here we are today. We've got the, 22 tri the 2020 trifecta. Um, there are people who want to cancel 2020, and there are other people who are celebrating all of the challenges that we're experiencing because, um, quite frankly, they've bought things to a head in a way that we're forced to face them. And you know, they they say we can only change the things that we face, right? So we've got the pandemic, the financial just the financial crisis, and the racial justice outcry. Um, the, there are some who would say that without the first two, the third one would not have had the power and the level of significance that it has had this year. Um, and there are a lot of theories around that. People were sitting still and able to see what was happening on the news. Um, people were already in an agitated state. And so it was like one more thing. Um, but here we are, people want change. Um, I'm looking at what people hope to gain from this um, lecture. And I think um, that I'm seeing a theme of people wanting things to be better. And these are some of the things that I came up with on my own, but I would love if some of you would put in the chat some of the things that you would like to see changed or better. And you can make them individual, local, you can make it your neighborhood, you can make it campus, or you could think on a broader scale to the city or the world. Um, some people like to think in terms of the universe. It's, okay, I'm starting to see things. Um, more diversity in publishing, movement on homelessness, significant prison reform. And so, a lot of these are really common themes. Um, some of you know, I just spent the last year on the campaign trail and I'll say I learned a lot and I got a chance to hear a lot of people. Yeah, I would like to see Trump's concession too. Um, I got to hear a lot of people express um, 
their hopes and their visions for the city of San Diego or the county of San Diego as they were campaigning to be our leaders. And so now, you know, the election's over. And, you know, perhaps this is a moment when we can all advocate for more um, positive change. And yes, a greater focus on our humanity. Um, I believe I am a proponent of the um, design lens thinking or design thinking so that we include empathy when we're creating solutions and think about who needs to be included. Um, one of the things, let's see, change is scary. So a lot of the things that we, oh, <laughs> thanks Jasmine. One of the things that we um, have to deal with is the present state is, this is what we have. This is where we are, it's what we know. Um, I don't know how many of you um, just by show of hands or uh, yeah, I guess that would probably be the best. Oh, there's no hand raising. Um, how many of you remember, have heard the saying, you know, I'd rather deal with the devil I know. Um, the devil I know is what, oh, I am seeing raised hands, you know, is what has kept us um, in oftentimes locked in where we are because, you know, we know, even though we might be uncomfortable with the way things are, it's safe because we know, kind of know what to expect. It's predictable. And um, a lot of times we can't even imagine the alternative to the current state. So a lot of times we have people who say, I don't like this. But when you ask them, well, what do you like? What would you like to see? Um, there's, there's silence. There's like the blank stare. And my hope is that Afrofuturism is a tool that we can use and think of the future in a different way um, and take away the limits of what we can't do and what's not possible. And just think about what we would like because if we can come together or come up with a shared vision of how we would like things to be and how we would like to connect with and relate to each other, we can make change um, because it all starts with the vision, right? So I bring up this quote from Emergent Strategy because um, there's a book I'm gonna reference in a minute called Emergent Strategy that came out in 2017, I think. But in 2012, Javran Rivera was talking about emergent strategy and embedded within this, the biggest thing that I see that's probably most relevant to this conversation is it is the process through which we articulate a clear vision of where we want to go. Um, and I tell in a good strategic process is one that crystallizes our intention. And I, and I say this because, you know, a lot of us are engaged in these strategic planning efforts and the best laid plans of mice and men. Um, so we make plans and then when things don't work out the way that we plan them, sometimes we abandon the mission because, well, you know, it didn't work the way we planned for it to work, right? So I ask that um, we adopt um, a more change tolerant and uh, amenable response. And so with that, I go to Adrienne Marie Brown because she was a student. Uh, well, some say that her philosophy is the offspring of Octavia Butler's writing, but she is um, considered a pleasure activist, a change strategist, um, and she helps people see things through a different lens. And the lens that she uses really is based on the writings of Octavia Butler. And the big thing, the root thing is all that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. And the only lasting truth is change. And God has changed. This comes out in Parable of the Sword. For those of you who have read um, the Octavia Butler's work, I encourage you to read Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents because some would say that they were quite prescient. Um, within the Parable of the Sower, there's even a presidential candidate who wants to make America great again. Um, they, you know, this was written in the early 90s. She talked about wall-sized televisions at a time when people had TVs that were um, smaller than our laptop screens. So I, I strongly encourage you just as a space to look at what the imagination can do. Um, many of us know that our cell phones are based on communicators from Star Trek and 
my question to all of you is what is our vision of the future for a more inclusive culture? I mean, a more inclusive and socially just campus culture, because I saw, and I see that as an example, um, yeah. we can look at more inclusive. So the question is, how do we apply that in real life? Um, how do we um, come together? So part of it is our individual ideas and part of it is our collective ideas. I didn't go into I didn't go into the background or the history of um, how we got to where we are because many of us are being inundated with it. Um, but the question is how do we change um, the limitations that we have? Um, and those limitations are not just limitations of non-Black people, they're limitations of Black people in terms of imagining a different way for us to um, navigate, moving around and connecting and making things happen in a more socially just and equitable way. Um, I thank you, Edwina. And I think that is a great place to start. Um, I think that right now um, we are coming out of a period of extreme divisiveness. And I can tell you that my personal vision is that we focus um, as much time and energy as we did in um, getting to where we are now in terms of moving in a different direction as a nation and as a campus. You know, we've done all this anti racism work. How do we find some reconciliation? Because um, there are a lot of different people with different ideas and if we approach this from a space of blame and uh, recrimination, um, we're not going to get anywhere. But if we can um, sh show visions of what it is we actually want to see, um, I encourage world building. So let's see, I also want to start with what's good. If you're talking to people who don't see things the way that you see them, and you start from a place of what's wrong and how wrong they are and how everything is all their fault, um, th they're gonna shut down. I've been in conversations recently where um, people were trying to um, advocate for um, changes in policies or practices and the tone was very you-based instead of we-based and they got people stopped listening. What could be better? Um, what are some things that we could do that would be better? I've been in a lot of conversations. Um, you know, I was part of the Born Free sessions, part of the anti-racism discussions, part of discussions with Shola Richards, um, with the Staff Association and Black Staff Association, and some common themes are emerging. And part of it is, you know, Edwin is right, it starts with our humanity and understanding that there is no, like, one way to present. Um, earlier, um, I had someone talk about um, not feeling black enough, and you know, I I struggle with that because you know, like I mentioned earlier, I've been called blackish because my interests are you know art, science fiction, and um, I actually like Lean Six Sigma and continuous development. I like looking at things in terms of how do we make them better. And that's not necessarily, you know, militant enough for a lot of people, but there is no normal. It's kind of like um, for people who are familiar with the movie, um, The Matrix, um, there was a moment in there where um, Neo or Keanu Reeves character was talking to a young boy who was bending spoons within The Matrix and he was struggling, he wasn't able to do it. And then the child looked at him and said, you have to remember there is no spoon. And so I think as we look at our perceptions and we look at how to reimagine, not just blackness, but just reimagine our society, we have to get to a space where we stop um, trying to create norms in other people. I think that um, the emphasis and the focus right now is on anti-blackness because um, people are being murdered. 
because of negative perceptions and assumptions of threat or danger that are not um, supported by any other evidence than perception. So I think that for me, that's one thing that could be better. And um, I appreciate what Edwina's point of view about how to stop being so binary because that speaks directly to um, you know whatever I think is normal is right and everything else is other. Um, if I have an idea and you have an idea, those ideas could be very different and even contradict each other without being in conflict. Because in reality, you can have two opposing ideas occupying the same space and thriving. Um, Afrofuturism Lounge. Um, this is a logo for a program that I created where I bring together science fiction writers and artists and publishers and creators of and innovators in a variety of different realms. And the whole overlap of everybody in the space is a desire to build worlds or to share about world building. Um, within this space, we have workshops on how to create comics, how to find careers in those industries, as well as um, how having a community garden is a futurist act because the idea of planting a seed and and watering it and waiting for it to grow is um, an act of believing that you can create something that wasn't there. I um, say in terms of us, we've all heard this like trite phrase, um, see it, believe it, achieve it. And yeah. You know, it seems really silly, but if we don't see it, if we cannot imagine it, if we cannot um, get rid of our um, self-limiting beliefs, um, we can't change anything because, well, you know, we've got those limits. And then we have to believe it's possible because it's really hard to get people excited and get people to move in a direction that they don't believe is gonna bear fruit. How many of you have gone to work one day and they said, okay, Today, we're going to start this new program and it's going to change everything. And you didn't know anything about it and you were just supposed to get on board. Was that exciting for any of you? <laughs> so, um, and then, so that belief is really there. And then the other part, and this is a part a lot of times people don't really like, is that any, um, any of it, it takes work and effort. Um, you know, I recently um, had a mentoring session where I thought I was further along a path than I actually am and had to face the reality that I've got muscles that I need to build and um, work that I need to do in order to get better at what it is I think I want to do. I appreciate everybody's um, input and I um, would love to um, know if anyone has any questions or anything they want to say because I figured out that I can actually unmute you and allow you to speak. So if there's anyone who has any questions, um, if you raise your hand, I can allow you to talk. No questions at all? Well, we've got low hanging fruit, um, small incremental improvements, challenging self limiting beliefs, accept and adapt to change and commit. Yeah, you can place them in the chat too. Or um, and commit to building community. Are these um, four things um, conceivable and doable? Um, can I ask um, that when you find yourself feeling uncomfortable, um, particularly when you're feeling uncomfortable because someone is different, um, and you don't have to like verbalize this, but maybe, you know, do a self check. Um, I know I have to do it. I can tell you a story about when I um, was doing odd jobs one winter to like make extra money for Christmas presents. And I was alone in the store in the department and there was a, a gentleman walking towards me and he was, he, was, he was a white guy and he had lots of tattoos and he was, he, his hair was cut really, really short. 
and he had on jeans and he had like a, a chain belt and um he had on doc martens and uh what do you call it the flannel um shirt and a leather jacket over it and he's walking towards me and the only thing i kept thinking as he was walking in the direction of the department i was working in this is a retail store was that i hope he didn't he doesn't need my help i hope he knows what he wants and he can just get it and i don't have to interact with him because i was afraid that my interaction with him would be negative well he needed help and uh, he came and approached me and he was so polite and kind and he even said i know the tattoos and everything are off-putting and i regret doing this he said but um they represent who I was less than they do who I am. Um, he brought up the subject and then he also asked for help and asked really good questions and I was able to help him and he made a pretty big purchase and the interaction was nothing like what I had feared or anticipated it would be. And I know that we all have had experiences of that type at some point and my hope is that we can um, catch ourselves when we're in that space and just, you know, take a moment and take a breath and allow the interaction and the experience to unfold. Um, sometimes we're interviewing people and um, we, because they don't dress the way we expect people to dress or they don't present the way we expect people to present, we sometimes set our expectations about what they're going to say or what they know. And um, my hope is that we can look and visualize a future where everybody gets to show up wherever they go as who they are and be taken um, seriously and treated with dignity and respect um, so that we can get to that better space. And I really um, left um, time for questions because um, I don't like the talking head model at all. If we were meeting in person, I would be able to see your faces and I would be able to hear your voices and we would be able to have a shared experience and um, grow together in a, in a beautiful way. And I'm trying my best to duplicate that um, over the internet. I do wanna tell you to stay tuned because um, coming soon in winter 2021, um, King Britt will be faculty in residence for the Cross Cultural Center and I don't know how many of you are familiar with this work, but um, it's super exciting. I put this, I deconstructed the flyer um, in an attempt to make it more visible to you. Um, there's a QR code so that you can actually um, download the full flyer. And then here's a picture of the flyer. Um, but he is doing, so he's a Pew Fellowship recipient, um, King James Britt, his real name. Um, he's a producer, he's a 30 plus year producer, composer, and performer in electronic music, um, Blacktronica, Afrofuturism in electronic music, a new lecture course. I've had a chance to listen to the music and look at some of the course content and assignments um, from his students, and I think that you will really enjoy this. And for people who didn't catch this earlier, um, Afrofuturism includes music, art, books and you know just creating space i've designed a construct called the afrofuturism dream tank where i actually invite people to come in and dream together and create um, visions for the near and far future and identify at least one action that they can do personally to make that thing happen. Um, it's based on um, appreciative inquiry. And I hope that we can just make that a part of our everyday in terms of thinking about how things can get better when we find ourselves in a space of, of discomfort. I don't personally offer work, writing workshops, but I do host them at my events. And, and Amy, I appreciate your, um, your feedback. So um, for me, my stuff is at afrofuturismlounge.com and I actually launched a podcast a couple of weeks ago because I, I don't know why, but I launched a podcast called Afrofuturism Dream Tank where I bring together um, people who are thought leaders or in some cases, laymen 
to talk about current issues and things that we want to see different and how we can envision them differently. Um, as well as, you know, I check in with some of the people I connect with um, through the Afrofuturism Lounge and other cons to talk about some of the things they've created or works that they have upcoming so that we can know what to look forward to. All right, so do we have any other questions? Because the other part of that is I don't believe in expanding meetings to fill available time. I think that we're all super pressed and we spend a lot of time on Zoom. And so I don't want to keep you longer than you want to be kept, but I do want to make sure I've given you everything that I can give you or that you need or want before we depart. Um, what do I do when I'm down? <laughs> so I am a grandmother. I have um, a two-year-old grandson who just seeing him lifts my spirits. At the same time, he's got that two-year-old energy. So he takes my mind completely off of everything. Um, so the making me smile part is um, spending time with him or spending time with my daughter who um, encourages me to do my art. So I guess when I'm down, which is a really weird thing, it even sounds weird coming out of my mouth. Um, I paint, I draw, I write, um, you know, sometimes I color and I don't know, I'm just, I like to create. And um, sometimes I shut down and just binge watch sci-fi shows. Um, a lot of, consume a lot of content. Recently binge watched Utopia which I don't recommend for a highly sensitive person, but I enjoyed it and you might enjoy it too if you like dystopian stuff. <coughs> oh yeah, someone who watched it. <laughs> Bizarre and fun is definitely a good word. How many of you saw Lovecraft Country? If you haven't seen it, I recommend it highly. It connects past, present and future. And okay, read and watch. My daughter bought the book, so now we're reading it. And then how many of you saw the Watchmen series? So those are two really good contemporary examples of Afrofuturism. Um, I actually purchased a blue wig. I thought I was gonna do my own Arinthia blue. And then I realized I don't know how to style wigs. So yeah, I gave up on that one. <laughs> um, so I have, um, an Octavia Butler book club on Facebook that I started. If anyone is interested in joining in on that, we're actually, um, oh, thanks. We're actually having a unpacking Octavia and her prescience discussion on Friday. Um, in terms of people I'm following on Instagram, um, so I probably have to pull it up, but there's a lot of <coughs> blurred content In terms of people, I follow John Jennings, David Walker, Greg Elise. Um, but then I also follow local organizations. I have, I think, four um, Instagram accounts to, that are interest based because um, I actually study continuous improvement because I enjoy it. I took my first TQM course in the late 90s. And at the time, it was it was attached to efficiency experts, which were always presented as really uncool. And so I never thought it would catch on because it had so many negative connotations. And it really brings me joy that people have come to a space of understanding that continuous improvement is actually a good thing. I did not read The City We Became, but yes, N.K. Jemison is not just in genre, she is um, a, an award-winning um, representative of genre. I also recommend um, Children of Virtue and Vengeance and Children of, what is it, Blood and Bone, um, written by a local author. And of course, my brain is going completely numb, um, but I'll attach a nice list, but the, those two books were her initial, The Children of Blood and Bone, was a bestseller and it was her first novel. 
and Children of Virtue and Vengeance um, was a bestseller before it was even released. And now we're waiting for the third novel, hoping that the story continues. I've also read a lot of, um, yeah. I've also read a lot of um, uh, Nettie Corfor's work. Um, Binti was really interesting. And um, was it who, let's see, Fear, I can't think of the name of it. I have to like pull out my bookshelf and look at the titles because one of the things is I consume it and then it just rests in my head. Um, any other questions about books or? Oh, Afrofuturism values in the workplace. I think part a big part of that in terms of attaching it to the workplace would be um, looking at possibilities and opening your mind. I think if you consume, um, so in Afrofuturism, there is the Afro-pessimist and the Afro-optimist um, lines. I tend to be more optimistic, but even when you look at the pessimistic works, um, understanding the potential possibilities and even how things logically follow. Um, I recently watched, um, I don't know how many people are watching Discovery. Any Discovery fans out there? Um, so I've been watching Star Trek since I was like eight. Um, but um, one of, on the recent episode, there was uh, there were people who were um, experiencing um, they were experiencing something that had been predicted um, millennia before in terms of environment and how the environment could affect their health, and then realizing those um, outcomes um, in the future. And um, it was a nice um, commentary on the fact that, you know, scientists are telling us about the climate and we aren't necessarily all listening. Um, in terms of uh, looking at, and I say looking at um, how um, people show up in the future or can show up in the future, um, one of the reasons Afrofuturism or even just the, Af the Black presence in science fiction became a phenomenon was the fact that historically science fiction had been so white and in some cases so racist. Um, I point to Barnum's Freehold or to um, H.P. Lovecraft as examples. And so to look at or pay attention to the absence or marginalization of blackness in that space, um, you then start to imagine what if we rewrote the, rewrote the future where black people were included and not necessarily in subservient roles, we could become more, um, help people to be more um, aspirational in their imaginings. Um, there are a lot of things that, you know, in terms of the workplace, we tend to, and not all of us, but sometimes people um, set expectations based on background and history as opposed to opportunity and possibilities. Um, when I came to work at UCSD, I started as a blank assistant too. Um, to my knowledge, we are not even hiring anyone at that level anymore. So it was like the lowest clerical position at that time. And the joke is the blank when the um, role was created was supposed to be filled in with something. And um, in most cases, no one bothered to put anything there. And so we were all blank assistants too. Yes. So, I mean, I'd like to think that maybe somewhere somebody actually filled in the blank. Um, but the, I remember when I became an administrative analyst for many people, because I had started at such a low level and, you know, and I will not say it's because I was black, because I don't think that would be fair or reasonable, um, that, you know, I had plateaued and peaked and that I should be quite happy that I had traversed so far in such a short time. And imagine how many people we have that are currently in spaces where um, people think that, you know, they've already gone far enough and that, you know, heaven forbid, they're considered a credit to their race. <laughs> um, so I think in terms of applying it in the workplace, I think we need to start looking at how we are consciously or subconsciously limiting um, the people that we work with in terms of what they could do or what they would like to do, and even um, managing our expectations of response. Um, I know that in education, a lot of times students um, are considered disruptive because of their energy level or how they communicate. And some students, some children, some adults, the way that they communicate excitement or displeasure 
is more vocal or more visible or less constrained and um, it's taken as a negative. But what if we channeled that excitement and energy and made it a positive and looked at it as a cue that, you know, this is somebody who's really on board and wants to help make whatever it is we're talking about happen. Okay, so we are at 1250 and Amy, yeah, Secretary 2 and it got, oh, it was Secretary 2 and got upgraded to Blake Assistant 2. And um, yeah, we saw how that worked. Um, so I need to share the survey. Sorry about that. This is the last slide. Um, I thank you for being here and giving me your time and attention. And I hope you gained something from this that we can all carry forward to experience a greater future. Um, please complete the brief survey. You can use the QR code, or if you prefer to type in the link as some people do, it is available. Um, this presentation has been recorded. And so we will be able, you'll be able to share it and see it. And let's see, put link in chat. Um, I should have thought of that. So um, thank you so much. And I really appreciate all of you um, sticking with me all the way to the end.